Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. James 1, verses 2 through 3. I wanted to share briefly about this verse. Um, one thing that I've noticed in my flesh, or my natural man, I should say, uh, is that I'm, there's a part of me that's always hoping for a trial-free day. There's a part of me that's always hoping for ease and comfort. And yet, what we know is, as, uh, as the Lord said, in this world, you will have trouble. Paul said it's through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. Jesus himself in Luke 9 said, you have to take up your cross every single day and follow me, or else you can't be my disciple. And so um, one thing that I was challenged by in this verse is to remember that I should not be looking for a trial-free day. It's a mirage. It's a deception. Um, it's, in a sense, a trial-free day is a discipleship-free day. It's a day in which I'm not a disciple, and I shouldn't have any desire for that. Um, and I should instead see that God appoints trials for a purpose. He appoints the pressure of the trial and the challenge of the trial and the strain that it requires for a purpose. And what this verse says is the purpose is, is to test my faith. And um, one of the things that I've been, uh, a picture that has helped me is you can think about a group of men uh, who are under enormous strain. They're working with grueling hours. They're, uh, they're exerting themselves to the limit. They have a very strict regimen. They have very little autonomy or free time whatsoever. You can think, what do these people look like? You can think of all of those things as a picture of a trial. And to me, what's interesting is they might look like a rugby team, or you can picture your favorite basketball team or soccer team, Barcelona or the Golden State Warriors. These are the All Blacks. Or these are prisoners of war. Uh, they're in a work camp. And if you think about it, both of these groups are under grueling work conditions, constant strain, demanding hours, exertion to the limit, under a very strict watch and regimen, very little freedom to you know, act as they please. What's the difference? I see that my trials aren't necessarily automatically going to produce strength. Sometimes they can result in weakness if I'm not um, watchful. And the thing that I was encouraged by in this picture is, the question is, who's the Lord of the trial to me? Is he a hard taskmaster who's driving me against my will every day? I'm just, I'm just saying, Lord, let this trial pass this unfair, undesirable circumstance, then I'll probably end the trial weaker than I enter that. But if the Lord of the trial is wise, loving, powerful, good, then I can leave the trial strong, stronger than I entered into it. And my prayer isn't, Lord, let this trial pass. It's, Lord, I want to pass this trial. I want this trial to accomplish the purpose for which you've sent it, that I might draw strength from it. And it's a, really, um, it's a really challenging thing to consider that, who is the Lord of the trial for me? Who is my coach? Is he a coach or is he a um, prison warden? And the Lord, uh, there's a verse in Psalm 25, if you want to turn there with me, Psalm 25, verse 10. That's really blessed me. It says, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Every part of God's plan for my life is good. It's similar to Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work together for good. There's that word, that same three-letter word is in each of these verses. Consider it all joy. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness. God is able to make all things work together for good. In the Old Testament, the burnt offering was commanded to be offered without blemish. And if I think about my life as a burnt offering, Romans 12 says, in view of the mercies of God, offer your lives as a living sacrifice. And if I want to offer my life without blemish, the secret is in seeing that his plan is without blemish. His plan is perfect. And the circumstances that he has appointed in my life, which often look like challenging trials, 
he has appointed out of perfect love, in perfect power, in perfect wisdom, in a perfect kind intention to fulfill his perfect purpose. But I have to see him clearly. And the thing that's interesting to me or that challenged me is to read in this verse, it says, consider it all joy when you encounter trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And it seems that the Lord there has made trials synonymous with testing of my faith. And it's really helpful for me to see that in my trial, the question is, it's actually a question about my faith. And I've noticed that the enemy can deceive me by getting me to believe that the, that the issue here is really something else. You know, someone is um, inconsiderate at work. And for me, the issue can be my natural man, my flesh can say, this is about human decency. And the Lord says, no, it's not. It's about your faith. The question in every trial is not whatever issue the enemy wants us to think it is. It, it comes down to my faith. Do I believe that God has a perfect plan? Do I believe that he is sovereign over all things and he's appointed every circumstance to accomplish his purpose? If so, as we heard even today, I'll see the hand of my loving father in every cup that comes my way. And so my faith is the, is the question. And for me, the operative word in this verse is the very first word. He says, consider, or it says, let us consider. But the first verb is consider it all joy. Does it mean, is it that it is joyful, that it's a joyful experience to be tried? I don't think that it, that's what that command means, consider. Another verse in Romans says, consider yourselves dead to sin. Does that mean I can't sin? No, I, you and I know, I know certainly. I have certainly sinned, even since becoming a Christian. It's possible to sin. But when he says, consider yourselves dead to, sin, dead to sin, there's a word that I've discovered is really helpful, which is choose. Choose to see this circumstance in this way. And when it says, consider it all joy, it's not saying feel joyful or feel like it's a great thing to be tried. It's saying, Choose to see this trial in the light of God's love, in the light of the Lord of the trial. And the other side of it, it's not just choose, it's also refuse to see it any other way. When I'm going through a trial, when, and you know, for me, a lot of times at the beginning of the day, it says offer the offering morning by morning. And you know, in the mornings, I'll think about my day, and I can see that there's going to be trying circumstances. And I can think, Lord, I want this to, I want it to accomplish your purpose. And I can want to choose, but I also have to, I, I, it says, consider it all joy, 100% joy. Choose to only fixate upon the good purpose of strengthening and purifying that God has in his heart. And part of what I've had to learn as the Lord has brought me through many trying circumstances is I have to exercise my will to also refuse to see trials in any other way. I refuse it. And it, again, it's an act of the will. It's not that all of a sudden it starts feeling good, but it's a deliberate act of my will. And in Romans 12, it says, do not be conformed to this world. Refuse your fleshly way of thinking, but be transformed by renewing your mind according to what God says. Choose. That is how I renew my mind when I choose to see God's purpose in a trial and I refuse what my flesh, what my natural tendency, what my desire even to avoid the trial or to be delivered from the trial, I don't want to be delivered. I want to overcome. I want your purpose. You know, like Jesus said in John 12, what shall I say? Save me from this hour? No, it's for your purpose. You brought me to this hour. Father, glorify your name. I want the name of Jesus Christ to be exalted. And there's a, that, that word consider, which is an act of the will, reminded me of another verse I wanted to mention as I close in 2 Peter in chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. It says, consider it all joy in James 1. And in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, regard. Again, it's that willful, deliberate choice in how I view regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. And what I see in that is 
in a way, the Lord is tarrying, right? He could return at any moment. When, when, the, when the Father says it's time, it's time. And I say, Lord, why are you tarrying? Why are you delaying? These circumstances, these trials that I'm supposed to consider all joy, they, it could be over if you just come back. And the Lord says, the Lord's command to me there is, regard the patience or the tarrying of the Lord, not as another day, you know, back in the coal mine or another day, you know, in, um, at the, in the chain gang. No. Regard it as salvation, as an opportunity to experience a fuller salvation, to experience a greater deliverance from sin. And so to me, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see. If I have a new day, don't expect for it to be trial-free. But if I have a day filled with trials, regard God's kind decision to allow me to have a day full of trials regard it as salvation. Lord, this day is meant by you to accomplish something more of your purpose. Thank you. Thank you that you've allowed there to be trials. Thank you that you've allowed there to be difficulty. I believe that by your grace, I'm going to come out as one of, as a strong warrior. I'm not going to come out emaciated and malnourished and discouraged and barely surviving as one through fire, as it says. I'm going to come out a warrior to the glory of your name. Lord, let it be so. I have to see the Lord of the trial clearly. And as we heard, I think maybe two weeks ago, it says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. I've learned that if I'm not seeing God, this is something the Lord's convicted me in, even in the last, this last week. If I'm not seeing God in my trials, if I'm not seeing the Lord of the trial, I need to confess I'm, I'm not pure in heart, Lord. If I were pure in heart, I would see your hand in this. And insofar as I'm not seeing your hand, Lord, I want to confess there's a problem with my purity. Lord, cleanse me. Wash me clean so that I can see your purpose again. I want to choose it. I want to choose to see it that way. But I can only do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. I will never be able to see God's purpose out of my own resolve. It only happens when the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of my heart again to say, your Father is behind all of these things. And when the Holy Spirit shows me, then I can rejoice. I can consider it all joy. It's been my experience. I want it to be my experience more and more. And um, I believe the Lord will help me do it.